Well, it's Christmas Eve, and I'm in the mood to do another anti-Crosley video. The featured specimen today is a model CR40 from 2007 and made in China. These models are still being made at a retail price, anywhere between $75 and $100, depending on where you're looking. This is a cheaply made three-speed record player that plays 33, 45, and 78 RPM records. And when I first obtained this piece, the problem was the little plastic cartridge retaining clip that's actually an integral part of the head shell had broken off, and whoever had this player before me attempted to glue the cartridge back in place only they didn't do it right, so I had to re-glue the cartridge. Now, the plastic that these head shells are made out of is not of the best quality to begin with, and after a few years, the stuff becomes even more brittle, therefore making it very easy to break, especially if someone was playing around with this cartridge. Well, Short of finding a junker record player to obtain another head shell off of it, the only thing I could do is glue this cartridge back in place. Now keep in mind, for the most part, Crosley does not supply repair parts for these models. For the exception of possibly the 45 RPM adapter, the stylus, which can be obtained from many sources, possibly even this rubber mat in the wall wart power supply. You know, those are the only things that might possibly be available to repair these models. Anything else, you can pretty much forget about it. In fact, from what I can tell, if one of these machines, machines, that's too nice of a word to call this thing, but anyway, if one of these units fails under warranty, They'll either just uh, refund your purchase price or exchange it for a for a comparable model. You know they don't even repair these things. Okay, now let's dive into this and see what kind of piece of garbage we really have here. We'll start off with its operating features. This particular unit, as well as most of the other portable Crosley units, run off of a wall wart power supply that plugs into the back of the set. Well, that's all fine and good, but, you know, these power supplies have been known to fail. And it's just something else to keep up with if you're the type of person that loses things. Now, if you had a vintage record player, the power cord would be hardwired into the unit, so nothing to lose there. Another thing, we have this little 45 RPM record adapter right here. Once again, something else to lose if you're the type of person who loses things. If you had a vintage single play record player, chances are the 45 adapter would be integrated into the platter and there's no way you can lose it. But more importantly, this is a three-speed model like many of the portables are, 33, 45, and 78 RPM. However, you only get a 0.7 mil LP stylus with these types of units. There's no flip over cartridge like there was in the old days where you had one side of the stylus for LP and then the other side of the stylus contained a larger 3 mil tip for 78 RPM. And when playing back 78s, you really need the larger tip. And they, the makers of this piece of junk, pretty much lead you to believe that all you need is one tip for all records. Well, that's not the case. Back in the early 50s, they made a compromise 2 mil stylus that was supposed to play all grooves, all groove sizes, but this particular one contains a 0.7 mil LP stylus. 
Now there's a company that makes a 78 RPM stylus for these players, but using such a stylus requires popping off the LP stylus and popping on the 78 stylus, and there's that chance of damaging the stylus or the cartridge if you're not careful in doing what you're doing there. Personally, I think any record player that has a 78 RPM speed in addition to the 33 and 45 speed should contain a cartridge with a flip stylus, one side for LP, one side for 78. That way you can just flip from one side to the one stylus to the other. When you want to play various types of records, you don't have to actually remove the stylus to play a 78. Okay, now let's let's pull the thing apart. I've already removed the screws, and let's see what the inside reveals. Here's our drive mechanism, as you can see, mostly plastic. It's belt driven via a cheap failure prone DC motor. Usually when these motors go bad, they either stop running altogether or the speed is inconsistent. You'll have a lot of wow and flutter and sometimes they'll run either too fast or too slow. Sometimes you can adjust the speed back to normal but within a short period of time it'll fall out of adjustment again. And notice here on the motor mounting screws uh, they were in such a hurry to assemble this that they uh, they missed the screw heads with the Loctite. So yeah, already already seeing some lack of quality there. But you know the fun has just started. Here's the amplifier chassis. I'm rather shocked to see such a large printed circuit board. The last Crosley that we dissected had a amplifier circuit board about the size of my thumb. But this set has outputs for line output as well as a subwoofer output. And I think the majority of this circuitry is is for the uh, line output and subwoofer output. This IC here with a small heat sink on it is basically your audio amplifier stage. We have a couple of transistors back over here that I think are being used as a preamp to so the uh, low output ceramic cartridge can drive this audio amplifier but obviously such a small IC you're not going to get much power out of this thing maybe maybe a hundred milliwatts per channel if you're lucky now let's look at our speaker arrangement this is a stereo model but Having stereo sound in, in such a small unit is really not necessary because with the speakers spaced no wider apart than they are, you're not going to get very good stereo separation. I mean, yeah, if you're standing right on top of the thing, you can, you can tell, but not if you're just listening to the thing in an average room setting. Okay, now for a really good laugh, let me dismount one of these speakers and let you see what that's all about. Yeah, this is funny. Look at this tiny little speaker. I've, I've had pocket transistor radios that had a more substantial speaker. And this plastic enclosure is really nothing special. It's just something for the speaker to mount to. No wonder this thing sounds lousy. This one has a good many screws, but it also has a good bit of hot glue on it, too. We have glue there. We have glue here. And the reason they have glue there is to stabilize these cheap wires. You know, it's not enough for them to actually be soldered. The wires are so cheap, they might just break under normal movement from being transported, etc. If this was a vintage unit that had decent quality wiring in it, you wouldn't have to stabilize everything with hot glue. It would stay intact on its own. Just solder the connections and that would be good enough. And notice this blob of hot glue that they have 
supposedly holding the wiring to the bottom of the cabinet, but you can see how sloppy that turned out. Notice our case covering is already starting to lift, probably because it wasn't glued too good from the factory. But yeah, it's sad that some kid in China had to work all week assembling these things in order to get a bowl of rice for supper. Okay, now I bet you want to hear this thing. Okay, well, I'll satisfy your craving right now. These screw holes are already starting to walla out just from no more times than they've been removed, which means the screws won't even get tight anymore. Okay, here we go. And that's as loud as it gets. And now here's a fairly worn out Al Jolson 78 on the turntable. We'll play that with the LP stylus just so you can get an idea of what it sounds like. I chose a rather worn record on purpose because a great many of the 78s that are in the average consumer's possession will be in this condition. So let's turn it on and see what it sounds like. Okay, you noticed it played, but there was a, a good bit of background noise there, and the fidelity was not as bold as it could have been. Now, before we move on to another record player that's of better quality, I'll play you a 45 on this one. Okay, let's see what we've got here. Okay, enough of this. Let's move on to a nice old vintage consumer grade record player that will blow this thing away. Okay, the last time I did a Crosley comparison video, I used a Newcomb Classroom record player from the 60s and I got my hand slapped for a couple of people because I compared an industrial grade classroom record player to a cheap Crosley consumer record player. Well today we're going to compare a consumer grade record player from 1954 to the Crosley from 2007. This is a symphonic that you might recall us restoring a few videos ago. Now, let's kind of go over some of its strong points. The Crosley has a cheap plastic tone arm. This has a nice metal aesthetic tone arm with a adjustable counterbalance spring in the rear of the tone arm. The cartridge is a stereo compatible unit with a flip type needle, one side for LP, one side for 78. As with the Crosley, we have controls for volume and tone, so that part's the same. Our speaker is a single four inch speaker here. This is obviously not a stereo unit, but you really don't need stereo when speakers are enclosed in such a small cabinet. You're not going to get much separation anyway, but the 
sound quality from this four inch speaker will blow away what's in the Crosley and our power cord is permanently attached to the record player so no wall wart power supply to lose we have our built-in 45 rpm record adapter as well as a nice metal turntable platter okay before we open this up and show the insides let's play the same records on this that we played on the Crosley I'll start out with the Al Jolson 78 and let you see how it sounds with the proper needle so we'll go ahead and flip this needle over to the 78 side okay here we go let's give it a whirl here Now, as you can hear, the 78 sounds much better on this unit than it does on the Crosley. The noise level is not as great on this unit, and the fidelity is a lot better. Our tonal quality is very nice for a 78. Now, let's play a 45 and a 33. So we'll flip our stylus back to LP, remove this record, set it to 45, and let's see how this goes. Well, I think it's clear which player sounds the best. So now let's open this one up and see what the inside looks like. Here's the underside of our player, a nice tube amplifier wired on a point-to-point -point chassis. Now, you know, I don't have anything against solid-state amplifiers or printed circuit boards, and they could design a better sounding solid-state amp to use in the Crosleys if they weren't so cheap. And we have a nice 4-inch speaker here. Once again, they could put something in the Crosley in the way of a speaker that's better than what they've got. Here's our drive system that consists of a nice AC-operated motor, now I can tell you in 25 plus years of doing this, I've only ran into two or three of these types of motors that I had to actually replace because they couldn't be fixed. Usually all these motors need is taking apart and cleaning them and re-lubricating them. When the DC motors and the cheap Crosleys failed, and that's pretty much it. You can also see we don't have any hot glue holding anything together when we need to hold a wire in position we just use a staple to do it and our motor board is actually made out of wood unlike the Crosley and our case is made out of wood we even have a schematic diagram that they provided us with in case the amplifier needs service which is something you're not going to find with the Crosley it's amazing that this record player being 60 years old and I can still get most of the repair parts that it will ever need to keep it going again. The Crosley, about all you're going to be able to be able to obtain is the stylus and the 45 RPM adapter and possibly a wall wart power supply. As far as any of the internal parts, say if the tone arm gets damaged or if the motor fails, then you're going to have a harder time finding those parts. Now comes the acceptance factor. In the past, I've tried selling restored record players like something like this and the old Caliphone school record players on all of the 
local Facebook buy, sell, and trade pages, and, and usually about the only reply I get is one or two people telling me that I, that I want too much money for them. However, I can put a Crosley up for 50 bucks, and it's gone in 30 minutes. You know, people have this misconception that these older record players are junk, and that they're going to suddenly burst into flames and burn their house down. Well, obviously they've never heard a properly restored unit, because if they did, they'd know better. In fact, part of me feels guilty for even trying to sell one of those Crosleys, but the other part of me says give them what they want and use the money to uh, buy more vintage stuff and, re and repair the vintage stuff. And maybe after their wonderful Crosley craps out after six months, then maybe they'll decide to, to come back and buy something that's actually worth a darn. Okay, now that you've seen the Crosley record player versus the 1954 Symphonic record player, I'd like to take this opportunity to bring up a few points that were made in recent comments on my other anti-Crosley videos. Someone referred to me as a communist and uh, said that they weren't that I couldn't make them buy anything. Well, for your information, I'm not holding a gun to your head to make you purchase a vintage record player or anything else for that matter. All I'm doing is simply educating the public, much of which does not know any better, and I've actually had people thank me for my anti-Crosley videos, people that were thinking of buying one of those pieces of junk, but didn't realize how crappy they are. But, you know, there's some people, there are some people out there that can be presented with the truth and still won't uh, make a wise decision. It's like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And also, you can lead a person to knowledge, but you can't make him think either. So, you know, if after being presented with the facts, if you still want to go out and buy one of those overpriced pieces of junk, Crosley record players, then by all means, knock yourself out. It's a free country, and you can do whatever you want to do. If you want to buy a vintage piece of equipment, then myself, along with many other people who are involved in the radio and phonograph collecting community, will more than likely be happy to assist you. Someone else posted that I needed to stop my whining over a $100 record player. You know, what do you expect for $100? Well, there again, my whole stereo system didn't cost me much more than a hundred dollars and no I didn't buy it new I bought it used I have a Technics turntable an old realistic receiver from the late 70s a pair of Technic speakers and it works just fine for my needs so you know why would I want to pay a hundred dollars for some uh, record player that's sub Fisher Price quality when I can play my cards right and spend a hundred dollars on quality used equipment that I can enjoy for years and keep it going again. Like I said before, as, as junky as those Crosley record players are, they shouldn't cost over twenty dollars. And depending on the features, I, I see these Crosley record players priced anywhere from 75 bucks all the way up on up to 300 plus dollars for the models with the built-in CD recorder. Well, you don't need one of those to burn CDs. You can do the same thing with a computer and software that's readily available over the internet and a turntable and a phono, phono preamp or receiver. You can do the exact same thing and have better quality recordings. Someone else commented that, well, I looked on the internet and I see a 1960s record player for some ludicrous price, and you think I'm going to pay that much for an old record player when I can get a new Crosley for $100? Well, newsflash, bud, you don't have to buy the, the first 
three ninety nine ninety nine buy it now suitcase record player that you see on eBay. You know, do do some shopping. Look at all your local thrift stores, your flea markets, etc., yard sales, estate sales, and you can find a nice 1960s or older record player for less than several hundred dollars. It may need restoration, but as I said earlier, with the help of me and others, we can help you out with that, and you still won't break the bank. Even on eBay, if you look hard enough, there's still plenty of decent record players and turntables that are either working or easily restorable that you can get for well under $100. Now, with all that said, what does one do who wants to achieve maximum record enjoyment from their LPs and 45s? Well, you need a decent turntable to start with, something from the 70s or 80s, preferably. Something by Pioneer, Technics, Marantz, Kenwood, Sansui, one of those brands. Even the better Radio Shack stuff. You'll need a decent stereo receiver. Or I say decent, but just about anything from the 70s or 80s or early 90s with a magnetic phono input will get you in business. If your receiver does not have a magnetic phono input, then you can buy an inexpensive phono preamp to connect between the turntable and the auxiliary input of your receiver. You'll also need a pair of speakers. And none of this will break the bank if you look hard enough. You know, just have a little patience and be willing to look at flea markets and estate sales and thrift stores, etc., and you'll eventually come up with something that's decent. You know, my stereo is all consists of all used components, and you know, I don't have that much money in them, and it suits my needs just fine. You know, but try to stay away from the newer turntables, like from the past 10 or 15 years or so, because those are incredibly cheap and lightweight. In fact, many of them don't even have a magnetic cartridge. They have a ceramic cartridge, just like the Crosley. And for the most part, their intended purpose is to transfer the audio from records to a computer via the USB connection on the computer. And like I said earlier, there's better ways of transferring your records to digital sound files that will give you better results using older equipment. And if you really don't want to fool with a component stereo, there are still plenty of options for nicer suitcase portable record players. Back in the 60s, companies like Magnavox, Sylvania, Voice of Music, Philco, Motorola, all had decent suitcase-style stereo record players that are very high quality and are usually easy to fix and maintain. Or you could search out one of the older Califone or Audiotronics or Newcomb school record players that were popular from the 50s through the early 2000s, although the ones made from the 50s through the 80s are probably the best ones. These machines are very well built, very rugged, or easy to work on. And once you clean them and lubricate them, and if you take care of them, they'll last a long time, as well as sound very good for what they are. But as far as component turntables go, even this little cheap Pioneer turntable from the late 80s will be a better alternative to most of what's out there today. And yes, there are still decent turntables being made today, but you're not going to buy them at the uh, big box stores for a hundred bucks. Okay, that's about all I've got for this video. Hopefully, for those who choose to be educated, all of this rambling helped you out. If you choose not to be educated and still think your Crosley is the greatest thing since indoor plumbing, then that's certainly your business, and by all means, keep using your Crosley record player. I hope you enjoy it.
But with all that said, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, and we'll get back to repairing some vintage electronics very soon. And here's an example of a Califone School record player, model 1430K. Plays all four speeds. Has controls for off, pause, and play, volume, and tone. Has a convenient little light on the end of the tone arm for use in dimly lit areas. Trying not to lose my head. <laughs> it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. My brother's doing bad for my mother's TV. Says she watches too much. It's just not healthy. All my children in the daytime, Dallas at night. And as you can hear, it sounds decent.